In today's episode, I talk with Coach Mark of the North Carolina Wesleyan Men's Program. If you like our interviews, I would truly appreciate it if you could subscribe to our YouTube channel, or if you're more of a podcast person, subscribe and review on your favorite platform, as we are on Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon, and more. And don't forget to follow us on all the different social media channels at discover underscore CS. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Discover College Soccer. Today, I'm lucky enough to be joined by Coach Mark Bowman from North Carolina Wesleyan. Welcome, Coach. Thanks for having me, Matt. Yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, we were just talking, and I actually I stayed in Rocky Mount this summer, driving north from Florida up to uh, to to my mom's in New Jersey. So yeah, yeah so it's I've a been, nice little midway. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, nice little stop over there in, in in your town. And and 20 years ago, got to got to play a match on on your field. So uh, you know, I feel I feel a little bit of a kindred spirit here uh, with, with NC Wesleyan. But so I'm, I'm glad to get you on on the podcast. So um, <clears throat> let's talk first on the recruiting side of things. When, uh, when is it that you guys are, you know, really starting to talk to players and start building out those recruiting classes? Um, well, for us, uh, we kind of have two different timelines. So our, uh, we have our domestic student timeline, and then we have a, we have a large international roster as well. Um, and so the, that kind of runs on its own separate timeline. Um, for us domestically, uh, we'll start looking at, at kids their junior year. Um, that's when we kind of start getting our database of, yeah, we, we think this guy could be, could be what we're looking for. And that gives us a year to kind of, um, get to intro introduce, have that introductory conversation, um, get to go watch him a couple different showcases and events. Um, maybe go out to watch a, a club match or a high school match or something. Um, so yeah, really, I would say, I would say fall of junior year, kind of that, um, Raleigh showcase is kind of like our kickoff for of their junior year so I'll, we'll start looking at, at guys that are juniors then see if we can get a chance to watch them at the next ecnl showcase or the next really big event that they're at um and then yeah it's just hey can we find a time to get you on campus have conversations with you kind of get to, to chat with uh with some people around whether it's a club coach or see if we have any if we know anybody in common um that we can kind of get a uh, a good idea on on guys um yeah, so that way we kind of know who we want going into our senior year, going into their senior year, I mean. Um, and then for our international recruits, um, we kind of go year by year. Sometimes it's even semester by semester. Um, and so really we'll we'll be in contact with our, with our recruiting agents uh, and recruiting agencies. Kind of start after the season, so November, December, for, all right, hey, who can we get in in the fall? Um, and, and really try and try and go go that way. Okay. Now you mentioned the, the the Raleigh showcase. So what 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 are some of kind of the must see events on your recruiting calendar? Um, for us, the Raleigh showcase is a good one because it's it's right down the road. Um, so that's a that's a really nice no brainer for us. Um, and then pretty much anything ECNL. Um, if there's an M MLS next event within the area, uh, anything kind of South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia. Um, even up into Pennsylvania a little bit. My my family, my parents live in Pennsylvania, so that's a good a good excuse for me to get my my wife and kids up to see uh, grandparents, and and then I get to go get to go do some recruiting events. So, um, so yeah, anything kind of from Pennsylvania down to South Carolina, we'll we'll try we'll try and hit any of the big ones. What about camps? Do you guys do your own camps, or do you or your staff work other camps? How, to, how does that fit in? Yeah, our summers we work a lot of other camps. So this is this is my first year as the head coach. Um, so I, in that transition, we didn't have any summer camps this past summer. Uh, I think we would like to try and get at least one spring camp ID camp and at least one probably two summer ID camps. Um, but our staff is very very busy going around um, to a bunch of other uh, camps. Whether it's the NC State camp uh, this year, I think we did NC State High Point, um, UNC. Uh, there were a couple other ones we did in there as well. Um, just trying to get get over to to a lot of the other camps and ID camps during the summers. Okay. Well, whether it's at a tournament or a camp or, or through recruiting video or anything like that, mm -hmm. what is it that kind of makes up your your hierarchy of things that you're looking for, whether it's on the field stuff or off the field stuff? Yeah. Um, obviously, talent talents would get you in the door. Um, so so for us, the 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 talent. Uh, has to be there. Um, that's what's going to get us to go. All right, yeah, we want to we want to get to know more. Um, 
soccer IQ is a, a big one. Um, we're a, with a large number of international students that have been that have been playing this sport since they were two years old and going to the Sunday leagues with their dads. Um, have been around high levels of, of soccer um, pretty much their entire lives. That that soccer IQ is there, and so we obviously want guys that can continue to come in and, and play at a high level. Um, I think athleticism is a big one. Um, obviously, if you can get all three of those, uh, you're you're doing pretty good. Um, yeah. But the other thing for me is is coachability. We want guys that want to come in and want to be challenged and want to grow, um, and are willing to to sacrifice maybe some of the the self driven goals uh, to see our team goals succeed. No, I like that. Well, in terms of um, domestic or international recruits, you know. Ha- well, I guess more on the international side, are you basing a lot of that on video or are you able to go internationally? And then, you know, with the domestic side, are you talking to a lot of the club or high school coaches to help you in that? How, how does that all work together? Yeah. So internationally, um, it's all pretty much all through recruiting agencies. So it's a lot of highlight videos and then conversations with guys and, hey, can we get a, can we get a full match or can we get a second highlight video or just send me a send me a clip of your previous game. Just continuing to build that relationship and getting to see him as much as possible. Um, and then uh, domestically, yeah, a lot of it is is contacts. All right, yeah, we we really like we really like Matt. We think he's a really good player. Let's see if we can get in touch with his high school coach or his club coach or a team. Maybe we have a, a teammate or somebody in our that we know that works for his club. Um, just to kind of find out, hey, what what's he like as a teammate? What's he like as a player? Uh, what's his personality? Is he a guy that we think is going to fit with our program? Okay. Well, you know, one of the questions parents always want to know is uh, how much is this going to cost me, right? So, yeah. And and I'm not holding you to to hard numbers here, but uh, <laughs> just give me an kind of an overview. You know, without athletic scholarships available, what? Mm-hmm. what what's available academically or what's a a typical student athlete walking into from a financial perspective at NC Wesleyan? Yep. Um, So we, we actually academically, we have some pretty decent, um, some pretty decent uh, uh, scholarships and grants and stuff Um, all the way up to full. I'm looking at my cheat sheet here. Uh, We got full tuition room and board. So you can get a full academic ride um, here with a uh, 4.0 weighted GPA, um, and then that, that also, it's an application process. So, um, that gets you up to full room and board for full tuition room and board and everything, everything paid for. Um, so obviously high academic students are, are a huge, huge thing for us. If we can get some good high academic students that, that helps a lot. Um, our, our basic scholarship is our, is our presidential scholarship. And that's a, that's a $20,000 scholarship for any 3.3 GPA weighted GPA or above. Um, and so that automatically gets the price tag to, I think it's somewhere around the mid twenties. And then obviously any grants or Pell or federal aid, any of that stuff comes in as well. Um, but yeah, so I think, I think that's kind of most of it. Um, as far as the internationals go, uh, they, we have a, an international grant that pretty much gets, um, most, if not all of our international students here for the same price. Um, I, I don't know what that price is going to be for the next school year yet, but um, that that's kind of how that works. Okay. Yeah, I had something like that at, at my previous institution, which made it easier for sure to get, yeah. to get international players. Yep. Um, well, let's talk a little bit more about the school because uh, mm-hmm. some folks may not have been able to drive through Rocky Mount or uh, <laughs> or play, a, play one college game there. Yep. But, uh, you know, besides what I would find clicking through the website, give me some of the, the awesome things, the things that make NC Wesleyan stand out that, that maybe I wouldn't know about. Yeah, I, I think for us, uh, one of it is just the the, uh, the size of the campus. Um, but we're not a we're not a big college, we're not a big institution, but we have a, a decent amount of, of land. There's a bunch of green areas and grass and trees, and so the the campus itself is just a gorgeous campus. Um, and that was one of the things that when I was when I was interviewing for the job and came on campus, that was the first thing I was like, man, this is this is cool. I, I like how spread out it is. It's nice. Um, all of our athletic teams, pretty much for the most part, our each sport kind of has their own their own field. Um, we actually just built a, a new turf uh, stadium that's going to have that's going to house our, our football team in the fall and our lacrosse team in the spring. 
And then obviously soccer will get to use it in inclement weather, but we really, really like our, our Bermuda grass pitch. So um, it's it's nice having that uh, available, but always the, the turf in, in cases of inclement weather is nice to, ha- nice to have as well. Um, yeah, I mentioned, mentioned before, I, I mean, this is, granted, this is 20 years ago, so I'm not holding you to this now, <laughs> but uh, it was by far the, the biggest and most beautiful pitch I'd ever played on. But of course, now I live in Florida and, you know, Manicured yeah. Bermuda is kind of the the standard down here now, but yep. uh, but you're right on that edge where you could still get some really nice Bermuda. Where I was up in D.C., we didn't we we couldn't really make it uh, make it make it stay green long enough to <laughs> to get yeah. you through the end of the season. <laughs> yep. No, we have we have a really nice Bermuda pitch, um, and and we have a really nice practice field as well. So that's one of the things for for our recruits is like the fact that we get to practice on a on a practice field that's the exact same size as our as our game pitch. Um, we manicure that one almost just as much as the, as the game field. Um, so that allows us to kind of protect our game field as much as we can, um, for using it for actual game day. So, um, those kind of things are, are really nice to have, um, just kind of, kind of some nice amenities. Yeah, for sure. Well, can you tell me a little bit how, you know, how do your students, you know, especially if you've got a lot of internationals coming in, it's different different kind of animal coming into an American college. So so how do your student athletes really balance their academic commitments as well as their sport commitments and what kind of support systems does the school have to help? Yeah. Um, so our, our men's soccer program is really, really big on the academic side. Um, uh, we, we understand that 99% of college athletes are never going to go on to play professional sports whatever the sport is like the statistics are 90 i think it's 98 or 99 it's well high 90s um are never going to go make a living playing the the sport that they love um and so for us that means that academics needs to take a needs to take a really big spot in our program if we want to s- prepare our our student athletes for success beyond beyond college um and so we actually have uh, built-in study halls and and built-in ways to to help our players um, be able to keep up with their academics. Um, midterm grades just came out, so we're ha- we've been having meetings with our with some of our athletes that need to find a way to to get their GPAs up and find ways to help them succeed. Um, we do have a, a tutoring service here as well on campus for the ac- for the academic side, um, but our our staff and our program we've actually built some some study hall and academic aid um, aspects into the program itself. Okay. Well, can you walk me through what what like an average week looks mm-hmm. like in the in, during the season, just in terms of classes, meals, practice time, which are game cadence traveling it looks like, and, and yeah, kind of an overall view of that. For sure. Um, I mean, for the most part, our uh, our game our game schedule is going to be pretty traditional Wednesday Saturday uh, game days, um, and so really guys will wake up Monday morning, go grab some breakfast. Um, maybe they have, they might have a class, maybe two classes in the morning, um, go grab some lunch. Maybe they have a, a class in the afternoon um, or they can head over to our uh, athletic training room and they need to get a good stretch in before practice or do some rehab on, or, on an injury or anything like that. They can go do that. Um, and then our practices are usually start around 4.30. Um, usually go 4.30 to 6, 4.30 to 6.30, at which point the guys will then go to the locker room, change out of their practice gear, take a shower, head over to the calf, eat dinner, Um, and then in the evenings they're really free to do whatever they want to do, whether that's if they got to do homework or study hall or whatever, um, or they just want to hang out and play FIFA with their with their buddies. Um, So we're kind of kind of pretty lax on the on the evenings, letting our guys just kind of have the freedom to to focus on what they need to focus on there. Um, so Monday, Tuesday, that's kind of what it's going to look like. Wednesday's usually a game day. Um, so if it's a home game, we want our guys in the locker room at minimum 90 minutes before kickoff. Uh, most of our guys, most of our guys are in the, are in the building probably two hours before kickoff, getting taped or getting a stretch or um, heat packs or whatever they need to kind of get ready for the game. Um, and then uh, about, 75 minutes before kickoff, we'll have our, our tactical talk and our pregame talk um, and then head out to the field for warm-ups. Um, we don't have lights on our field, which means we don't get a we don't get any home night games, but it also means that, that all of our guys after a game, the calf's open, so you don't have to go figure out what you're going to do for, for dinner after the game. Um, so our guys, after after any most of our home matches, will head over to 
head over to the calf, get their dinner, and just kind of get to enjoy their evenings again. Um, and then for away games, I mean, most of our away trips are, are day trips. Um, our conference is, is fairly compact. I think that, I mean, the farthest trip we have is Brevard, uh, which we're actually taking this weekend. So that'll be, that's our only overnight conference trip. Uh, other than that, pretty much everything else is, is uh, single day trips. So that makes it nice. Guys aren't missing multiple days of classes and uh, having to try and find a way to make that up. Um, they're just, we're able to, to leave. Uh, fairly fairly decent time, uh, so guys don't, aren't missing tons of classes. Okay, well let's let's talk more about about the team, the soccer side of things. I mean, is there a a roster size that that you're trying to hit every year? Yeah, I mean, so we have a we have a first team in the reserves. Um, so and we we focus really hard on making sure um, that we're we're putting the the effort into our reserve team. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of programs that's kind of just their yeah, you want to come be part of the team here, go jump on the reserves. But we really want to make it uh, something that is um, that's really focused on as well. Um, we want our we want our reserve guys to really see a pathway to get to the first team, whether that's later this season or next year, or for some guys it might be in two years. Um, but we uh, so we have we have thirteen um, reserve game matches, sixteen first team matches. But to go back back to your question of of roster size. Um, my ideal roster size is 24 field players plus goalkeepers for the first team. And then about the same for the reserves as well. Um, so that, that gives us a really good chance. If we have 24 field players, we can play 11 v 11, only have two subs, or we can, um, play eight v eight. Anything we want to do in eight v eight, we can have three teams without needing to, to rotate players or anything like that. Um, so it just makes training sessions a lot easier and allows guys to kind of get into a rhythm, um, together. As they and then we can kind of uh, train in in our functional groups as well. Okay. What about staff? Uh, how many staff do you have? What role does everybody play? Yeah, so we have two full time staff: myself and our assistant coach um, Cooper Hall. Uh, and so my uh, my role is the I oversee the entire program. Obviously, I'm the head coach for the first team, um, so I run all the first team training sessions. Um, and then Cooper, uh, he's the first team assistant and the and the reserve team head coach. Um, so he'll he'll run all of our reserve team practices. Um, ideally, I'd love to have at least one, if not two, volunteer coaches. Um, this year, that just that just didn't work out. Um, but ideally, I'd love to have a staff of four. That's my that's kind of my goal going into to each season. Um, that, that way, we can we can have a little bit of flexibility in in how guys are. Or we can. Yeah, have more flexibility in training sessions. Um, but, yeah, so currently our, our staff is two, two full-time uh, coaches. Okay. Well, how would you describe, you know, your style of coaching, the team style of play, and just kind of that overall culture of the team? Yeah. Uh, I, I would class myself classify myself as a, as a player's coach. Um, for me, I look at this, and, and I really want our players to have a great experience. Um, but I also want to – trust them and treat them like like adults i mean we're talking 18 to 22 year old men who are having to figure out all right what's life going to be like in the in the big world and so can we help prepare them for that um and and so the the culture aspect of it is we really want to have a player driven culture um we want to find and of course that that's part of our recruiting as well like we want to find guys that um that are going to be leaders that are going to help us have a, a player driven culture because uh, I only get to be with the guys two hours a week, two hours a day in practice or a game. Um, so that's that leaves 22 hours where the culture could be different from what I'm coaching. Um, but if we have a player-led culture that's the same on the field as it, all, as it is off the field, that really gives us a chance to kind of grow as a unit um, 24 hours a day as opposed to just – Oh yeah, it's gonna. We're gonna do it for two hours during practice, and then we're gonna go to the calf and all gonna go do our own thing, um, and kind of the standard changes between uh, between what we're doing when coaches around and what we're doing when coach is not around. Um, and so for me, the 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 player player driven culture is a is a really big thing. Um, that's something that we're gonna work on identifying a lot this spring. Um, as this this will be kind of be my first off season. Uh, so we'll, I'll have had a chance to really get to learn the guys, learn what, what they want, um, give them a chance to kind of see a little bit of how, what kind of program I want to run. Um, but then in the spring, it's really going to be about putting that, the onus on them to, hey, all right, boys, what's the, what's the culture look like? How do you guys, what do you want this team to look like? 
Um, how do we build a culture that's going to maintain the, the standards and history of success that this program has had in the past? Um, and then really just holding our players to that standard that they've created. You, you mentioned you mentioned the off season, so I mean mm -hmm. I know it's kind of your first one I think coming up. But yep. you know what what will that off season look like just in terms of of what the players are doing soccer wise? What may maybe they might be to do a non soccer wise? What does that yeah. non traditional season look like? <laughs> yeah, well I mean obviously in the in the Division three realm it, it's uh, we're we're limited on what we're allowed to do, um, and so we're only allowed fifteen training sessions in one game day. Uh, in the non-traditional season. So um, what that looks like is we'll usually start training after spring break um, and then sometime around Easter weekend, that'll be the culmination of our 15 training sessions and we'll have a game day, try and have three, two other, two to three other teams show up, see if we can do a three or four team tournament, get our guys seeing multiple different teams, um, not just, not just one, not just one kickoff against one team, but can we get different styles, different um, programs coming in. Um, and so, but that also gives us January, February, and the first half of March where we're not doing anything as a team soccer wise. Um, so obviously we're allowed to do our, our voluntary weightlifting sessions, we'll do our voluntary workouts and fitness sessions. So we'll, we'll do that, hold that for our guys. Um, but that's also where the, uh, the, the player driven culture comes in massively. Um, if you have a, a culture that's driven by the players, now the players are the ones that are going out and running a training session or working on, on stuff on their own. Um, and it's not a coach driven session where, all right, I'm saying, all right, guys, you have to be out at the field at such and such a time for training. Um, cause I can only do that for five, for 15, 15 training sessions in the, in the semester. Um, and so if we can really get that, that player driven culture, um, and get guys that, that really buy into that player driven culture, it gives us a huge opportunity to continue to grow as a team, even when the coaching staff can't be there. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you guys uh, use any sort of, you know, technology at all in terms of film or trackers or uh, whether that's in games or practices that you guys doing any of that stuff? Yeah. So we actually have Spideo. We have a mounted Spideo camera. Um, it's right outside our, our locker room building on a 50 foot pole. So it's got a great vantage point. We have a really good uh, kind of a tactical cam, um, which is cool. And that allows our guys to, to go back and, and watch their film. Um, unfortunately, as a staff of two with a roster of 50 plus, it's really hard to do the GPS stuff or any uh, any of the other technology things, um, which is one of the reasons I'd love to have some volunteer coaches that can come and help us with that, with those aspects as well. Um, but for us, film is a really big thing. We want to make sure that our guys have as much film as possible that we can sit down with them and review that film, uh, whenever possible. That's about the only technology thing we have at the moment. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate, uh, everything you've, you've told us. We've covered a lot of ground, but I always like to end these with the same thing as what haven't we covered, uh, whether that's the recruiting wise, the school, academics, athletics, anything uh, or anything else you want to talk about the recruiting process. Uh, this is kind of your chance to, to let anybody know anything else that you'd like them to know. Yeah. Um, so for us, I think recruiting, I think there's I've, I've heard it from a set from several recruits before that they look at our roster and they see so many internationals and they're like, ah, well, they must not want American kids. Um, and for me, for me, the perfect balance is having having both groups, having internationals and domestic kids, because that that they both come from different backgrounds. They all come from different nationalities, different focuses. Um, and I think that the, the best way to, to have a program is to have a good mix of both domestic and internationals. Um, so anybody that's that's listening to this, if you're a domestic student, don't look at our roster and say, ah, they, they're not interested because we are. Um, so, but the fact that we also have international and domestic um, means that as, as our, our staff kind of has to break that up as well. So I, I do all of our international recruiting. Our assistant coach Cooper does most of our domestic recruiting. Um, and so that's, that's another thing I think recruits see is, oh, it's the assistant coach emailing me, not the head coach emailing me. Um, I must not be that important. Uh, no, it's just, just the way we have it split up um, so that we're not overwhelming either myself or my assistant. Um, so those those two things are really big things, I think, for, for recruits to know. Um, and then for me, it's also just the history of this program. This this program is a, is a has had a very good history of success. 
Um, we've been in three of the last four conference championships. We've won two of the last four. Um, been to the NCAA tournament nine times. So it's we're not a program that people think of a lot because we're in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, not in a not in a big city or not up in the Northeast. Um, but if you're looking for a, a program that's going to have a, a really high standard, has a history of success, um, and is going to allow you to experience multiple different cultures and nationalities and languages. Um, for me, that's a that's a huge invaluable piece. Um, there's not many programs and not many schools in the country that have the international flavor that we do, um, and I think it, it just adds another opportunity to to expand your worldview as you get through college and and kind of start moving into the real world. Excellent. Well, coach, we wish you the best of luck. Hopefully, you can make it uh, three and five on those conference championships. So uh, that's the goal. Be Best of luck uh, making that happen, and if you, if you get down uh, down here to Bradenton to any of the tournaments here at Premier IMG, give me a shout, and, and we'll grab we'll a do. cup of coffee, all right? Awesome. Sounds good. Thanks, awesome. Matt. Awesome. Thanks, Coach. We are excited to be part of Podcast Row at the 2023 United Soccer Coaches Convention in Philadelphia from January 11th to the 15th. The convention is the ultimate event for soccer coaches, administrators, and fans of the beautiful game. Ignite your passion through captivating presentations, on-field demonstrations, exhibits, and networking events for any coach. Whether you are attending alone or bringing the whole coaching staff, there's no better place for soccer coaches to learn, network, and experience the latest trends in soccer education. Visit www.unitedsoccercoachesconvention.org to register. Come join us as we celebrate our passion for the beautiful game.